Please be polite and keep your phones off and stay seated during our speaker. Now let's welcome Pam all the way from the valley. Give Pam a big hand. I'm a little shorter than you are. There we go. I'm Pam White. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, you guys. Um, my sobriety date is 731 of 1993, and for that I'm incredibly, incredibly grateful each and every day. Um, I have a sponsor. She knows I'm speaking tonight, so she said she'll get a report afterwards and find out how I did. Um, my sponsor has been sober a long time. I'm very blessed to have her as a sponsor. I believe in sponsorship, regardless of how long you've been sober. I believe that that's really been a gift of this program. So I'm been taught to share a little bit about what it was like, what happened, and what I'm like now. I'm not good at being general, but I'm gonna try really hard and keep it under an hour. Um, let's see, I grew up in New Jersey. I was the oldest of three kids, three girls, and I had my first drink at six years old. I did. It was Christmas. Um, parents had this ro roaring party going, had two bowls of eggnog. Being the good budding alcoholics we were, my sister and I thought it was important that we taste the eggnog out of the bowl that people seemed to be, I don't know, a little happier, a little more energetic after they drank out of that bowl. And I remember that drink. I remember that drink like it was yesterday. And if I close my eyes, it's like this heat went from my head to my toes. I grew tall. My hair was curly instead of straight. I could talk to anybody. I wanted to talk to all the adults at the party. And I chased that feeling until I was 32 years old. I know that today. What I didn't know at the time was that I had a disease called alcoholism. I have alcoholism through both sides in my family, but that's the secret nobody talks about. Nobody ever told me about alcoholism. They talked about high blood pressure. They talked about diabetes, but we did not talk about alcoholism. Um, I loved to drink from the first time I picked up a drink, without question. Now, I couldn't get a drink every day at six years old, but I was chasing that and whatever I could to start to make myself feel different. I always felt different. I hear that from a lot of people, but I really did. And I still do today for my family. I'm sure I've been adopted. They just haven't shared that with me. But uh, it just, it's just the way it is. So I grew up in New Jersey. My parents both worked. They uh, traveled to New York every day. So being the oldest sister, I was in charge of a lot. Um, I felt like I became parentized by about eight or nine years old. I was doing things that kids should be out playing and having fun and doing things that are fun. Um, but this was a necessity in my family, so I did that. Um, my parents were not religious people. They had been married in the Catholic Church. My mom decided she didn't like the church suddenly. My dad wanted to be a priest. Can you imagine? What were these two doing together? Um, but... So we didn't really go to church. So on Sundays, everybody in the neighborhood would go off to their you know, synagogue, mosque, the church, wherever they were going. And we were the only kids still at home. And I didn't get it. And I remember when I was trying to fast forward to, I finished high school and I had gotten a track scholarship to Princeton University, but I had successfully drank myself out of that scholarship and any opportunity to go to any type of an Ivy League school. I went to high school, I went to general uh, grade school, to middle school, I was drinking whenever I could possibly drink. Um, but I was living this life of student body president, fall down drunk. You know, um, athlete on the track team, fall down drunk. And I was balancing so much of this because I need to keep it a secret because my family perfectionism was very important. We needed to look good. And I'm not saying it was, there was, it's a terrible thing to be is want to do well and be the best. When that becomes the overriding reason for all the decisions you make, add a little alcohol or a lot of alcohol to that, you've got some problems. So when it came time for me to go to college, um, I had nowhere to go. And so my parents found a all girls Catholic college to send me to in Pennsylvania. Okay, I'm talking nuns and priests living on our floors, okay? Now, the one priest was the chaplain for the flyers, so there was something a little cool about that, but I was finally out of the house and I could drink the way I wanted to. And I remember the Phillies won the World Series that year and the nuns loved baseball. Just telling you, that's how these women were. So we'd sent a case of wine up to their, the convent and they thanked us very much for the beverages during the game. And I proceeded to go out. And I have to tell you, I was only at college, maybe one or 
two weeks, and so I really didn't know my way back. So I wound up, as usual, at the party at Temple University. Um, the police were there. Um, ambulances were there. There were some talk of punches thrown, and they were by me. Um, and apparently, I caused quite a brouhaha there at the university. And they said, well, where do you, go, where do you live? And I said, well, I know where I live, but I don't know how to get there. So they thought, okay, this is great, right? So they called the college, and in comes sister to come pick me up. Did you ever see the flying nun? I know I'm dating myself. Okay, you know that station wagon? That's what she was driving. Everybody's getting cabs, and their friends are picking them up, and I got this nun showing up in a station wagon to pick me up. And she looks at me, and she says, I want you to know something. Now, I've only been there a couple weeks. I want you to know something. You are class is one of the worst in the 150 year history of this university, worst class we ever picked. We were all drunks, every one of us. We I mean, found our people, you know? And I remember going down one night and I remember going downtown to uh, Smokey Joe's, which was like the 15th college of the University of Pennsylvania. They acquired them. And something not so fun happened. And that was that I was walking drunk out of the bar and I was being dragged along by a man that was much bigger and much taller than me, and I was fighting with him, and he was trying to take me back to the fraternity house, and thank God, another guy at another fraternity saw this and saw something was wrong, and he interceded, and he was a decent person and made sure I got in a cab and went home. I put myself drunk in so many situations that I shouldn't be here right now as your speaker, and I know that. I know that because three of the women that were in my group weren't so lucky. They weren't so lucky. And it was a really, it was a, you'd think that would be something that would shake me to my core. But you know, I didn't, I didn't understand that. I'm a real alcoholic. I don't drink because I want to feel better. I don't drink because I have a choice about it. I drink because I have an allergy that starts with an obsession of the mind that says, hey, when, remember how that felt? Yeah, okay. And then I'm, I'm off and rolling. I don't, even, I don't even know what happens. People that are with me that are normies, they're getting tired and they've had too much and they're relaxing and they're feeling it. Me, I'm like, woo, I'm on the bar dancing and wanting to do shooters, you know? I mean, that's just how I roll. It's just how I roll. So after being in Pennsylvania for a period of time, my parents decided they were tired of paying for my education at this college of nuns and priests because I was still getting in as much trouble as I was when I was at home. So my parents decided not to get divorced, bad idea, move us all out to Arizona together, you know, which I thought was really bad. And I thought everybody out here were like cowboys that rode, you know, had bell-bottom pants and listened to country music. And if that's you, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, that's cool. But I came from like the city and from like New York and it just, I, I just thought this is going to be, this is the worst place you could have sent me. And so I go to Arizona State University and I'm trying not to live with my parents. And what I did was I got a job as a resident advisor, which means my own room, my, nobody monitors me. I monitor the alcohol and the drugs and the other things that I find on my floor. And my response to my peers was, as long as I don't see it, you don't have to worry about it. If I see it, it's mine. I mean, what, what was I thinking? You know, I, I'm, running, I'm running like a drug operation here on the 12th floor of Manzanita Hall at Arizona State University, you know? Um, but also we had fire drills, like every night people kept setting off the fire drills, so we would be in our beds dressed, but the worst was when we were hungover and drunk and we're stumbling to try to get out of this building and people are pushing us and, and oh yeah, I was forgetting to go to class. <laughs> Like, I was there for a reason. Now, I want to tell you something. There was a period of time that I would have told you my objective was to become an attorney. I wanted to be a lawyer. I knew I could go to law school and I could kick ass. I knew that I could write well. I knew I had gotten good grades in school. But something happened after I got that first drink. So, there was an idea that got planted that said, yeah, but then can you do that? And can you do that if you do that? That's like, that'll take all your time. I don't have time for that. I, I, have, I have life to live and to enjoy and, and, and just party. And this is what we're supposed to do. Well, what gradually happened, guys, was that people around me that I was in college with, all of a sudden they were like graduated. And I was still there. And it was like, I was taking English 101 for the fourth time. And it was like, wait, what's going on? So they very nicely asked me if I want to take a break from school. And I decided to go to work for the Arizona Beverage Guide magazine. That's the Liquor Trade Mayor's Magazine of Arizona. <laughs> God, it was an alcoholic's dream. I got to go out and they gave me free liquor and I would taste it and tell them how it was. 
and I could take stuff home. And people invited me to their wineries in France. And I thought, oh my God, how did I get this job? This is what my thinking was like. This was my best thinking. This is my best thinking from day one. You know, I've got life figured out. <sighs> so to take a breath, you know, life started to fall apart really hard about that time. Um, most of my friends graduated as I first said from college. Um, I didn't have a degree. I could barely hold on to a job. Um, I was sick all the time from drinking. My drinking had now become more daily than just the weekends because, hey, I don't, I don't go to work. I don't have to worry about getting up in the morning. And so I was drinking. And I was drinking a lot of alcohol. And I remember um, one time going to the Circle K near my apartment. And I, oh, by the way, I'm one of those people that hid the bottles and I lived by myself. Anyone, anybody out here do that? Yeah, right? Yeah, I, yeah. So I go to the Circle K and the guy's like, um, having a big party up there, huh? And I used to black out a lot. And I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah, you've been down here like four or five times to get cases of liquor. And I'm like, who's drinking all my alcohol? It was me. Oh, my God, I had no clue. I had absolutely no clue. So, you know, I finally uh, decided to do with any smart alcoholic in training would do, who was, you know, burning their life to the ground, I decided to move to California, because I heard out there they were a lot more fun, and went to work in a restaurant, and we drank on the job, and they dealt drugs in our, in that restaurant, and the owner took us all aside one day in tears, sobbing, begging us to stop, because he was going to lose his license, and we all went... <laughs> And so I began to have lower and lower and lower companions until I was the lower companion. I woke up one day and I was working in a residence hotel bar in downtown San Diego between the jail and the Greyhound bus station. And people would come in and they would bring me their stuff and I'd look at it and I'd give them some money for it. And then when I got out, they came to buy it back from me. I thought I was being helpful, you know, to help them to be able to get started again when they left uh, jail. Sometimes I would work in the Greyhound bus station. Um, I had a guy one time come in and he said that he was thinking about killing himself, but he decided maybe shooting me would be better. And I thought, oh, that's kind of a bad idea. But these are, these are the places I was spending my time. I had a man that was drinking in my bar on a Sunday and, you know, I walked out of the bar to close up and he was laying on the ground and he was coughing and choking and people were stepping, were stepping over him like he wasn't there. And I'd served him. I'd served him all that alcohol. And for the first time, I saw me in him. I saw me in him laying there. And I helped him get up and I gave him some soda and we called 911, but it didn't stop me from drinking. Why? Because I'm an alcoholic and I'm powerless over alcohol and my life was unmanageable. And no matter what I did, it got worse. It got worse to the point where I wanted to die every single day I woke up and took a breath of fresh air. I just wanted to die. I didn't know what to do anymore. I, I didn't understand how I'd gone from this, you know, a plus student athlete with scholarships with stars in my eyes to somebody who was going home every night and just drinking and drinking and drinking and other things came my way to help me drink even more, which I swore to myself I'd never do. I swore I'd never do that. And my life became a place that I would be at home during the daylight and I'd go out at night because I couldn't face you who were doing a normal life, were going to work, were doing normal things. I couldn't picture myself belonging to society anymore. I, I just, I, I, I was so disgusted with myself and my life. Then one night I had, uh, I had a roommate. And I will tell you, she was very interesting. She was, uh, had been a, um, a clown at the Barnum and Bailey Circus, went to college for it and everything. And the other job she had part time was to clean people's houses in Manude. So I declined the sec that offer to work with her, but I did move in with her um, into her apartment. Um, and I decided one day I was going to grab a handful of pills out of this beautiful glass jar she had with all these things in it, which I did not even know what they were. So I just popped them, took the water, and started walking the half a mile down to the Ocean Beach Pier. And as I'm getting close to the pier, I'm starting to feel very tired. And I get out on the pier, there's one way in and there's one way out. And I get to this bench and I sit down and I'm thinking, I, I can't do this anymore. I just can't. I, I don't. I don't know this person. I don't know this life. I don't know anybody that I grew up with and my family that has this life. What? 
and I decided to jump off the Ocean Beach Pier. And I made an attempt to do that more than once, but this time I got stuck on the railing. It was a very tall railing. And as I slid down, imagine the picture, I'm sliding down, and I'm sitting on this bench and I'm thinking, oh my God, I can't even kill myself, right? And I don't know how long the time passed, but I closed my eyes and something, somebody put something down next to me on the bench and I heard as clear as day, you don't have to live this way anymore. And when I opened my eyes, there was a Delhi Reflections book next to me. And I looked back on the pier and I looked and I didn't see anybody there. That was, I didn't know it then, but that was my first God shot. Because see, I didn't believe in God when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't believe in anything. I didn't believe in anything. You could not tell me there was anything greater than me that was, that this was the life they were giving me, they wanted for me. That made no sense. And I saw that book, I didn't know what it was, but I kept it. And I went back to my roommate in her apartment and I continued to drink and to drink and to drink. And the people I started spending time with were scary and dangerous. They were people that live with people, I swear to God, live with somebody who is actually a serial killer in San Diego. Um, I attract people, I'm telling you, it's not good. And uh, yeah, she was telling us that story. And then there was a guy that played in a band we listened to every weekend. And these are the people we did drinking and other things with um, at night. We lived in the nightlight. And uh, turns out he was the duct tape rapist. And I remember my friend was more concerned that he never approached her and that she didn't know until after the news came up with it. And I'm like, oh my God, who are these people I'm spending time with? I mean, this is, in, this is insane. So I went back to my apartment and I remember looking out at the beach and they have the fire rings out there. And I'm looking out and I, I honestly don't know where this came from. I just, I just don't. I remember getting, was on my knees. And I said, God, help me, please. I don't know what to do. And within 24 hours, I had a knock on my door. I swear to God. And my sister, oh, I forgot to tell you about her. She's my younger sister. See, she used to drink with me and be with me out when we were partying. And I didn't even notice she wasn't around anymore. Do you ever have people like that? They just kind of disappear. We don't know where they go, but they're not drinking with us anymore. She gone to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I heard a knock on my door. And it was her boyfriend who was in the program and people I've never met or been able to thank correctly, directly today. And they paid my rent and they collected all the stuff I'd kept, you know, cable boxes and that crap that we used to collect. And they said, we're taking you back to Arizona. And I thought, oh my God, that's how this happened to me. It was living in Arizona. It's the worst place on the planet. I don't want to go back there. And I said, okay, well, we'll just drop you off at the corner. So they gave me a, a cheeseburger and I think a cigarette. And I hadn't eaten in a while. I was probably about, I don't know, 80, 90 pounds lighter than I am. I mean, I was like, a, I looked like a skeleton. I had no idea how, how sick I had gotten physically as well. And oh my God, riding over here to Arizona, my sister's boyfriend's like, he's talking really fast and I can't understand anything. I haven't slept in a week, you know? And he's like, oh, and by the way, don't tell your sister I'm still dealing drugs. I'm just not doing them anymore. I'm like, what? He's, like, he's telling me all these things. And I'm like, and if you go to the west side, that's NA. If you go A, he's on the east side. And I don't, I don't know if I'm supposed to remember all this or what, is this a test? I have no idea. So I get over to Arizona and now I'm thinking, oh, this isn't so bad. Nobody's chasing me for money. I'm not worrying about how to keep a roof over my head. I was this close to being homeless, very much so. Um, I want to back up. I forgot a, part, a story I really have to tell you with my sister. Before that knock on the, uh, after the knock on my door, what happened was I called my sister on a payphone and I had said to her, I, I think I'm thinking about moving. That was code for I'm being evicted again. And she, I said, uh, I need to come stay with you for a little while. And she said, I'll call you back. And I'm like, I don't have a phone. <laughs> so I'm thinking that means no. Well, she got a hold of me somehow. And she said, um, I was told that you can stay for 30 days, but then you have to go. And I'm like, 30 days? 
you don't know who you're talking to here. I get into your house, I'm not leaving. I'm a squatter extraordinaire. I've been doing this for 10 years, okay? No problem there. So I get on the bus with my cat, my Sony Walkman, and my two or three pieces of clothing, and we get to her place, and there's these people in the living room smiling and laughing, drinking coffee and smoking cigarettes with these blue books. And I'm thinking, oh my God, she's at a Bible study meeting. That's how she got sober. She's gonna try to get me to go to church. And they weren't interested in me. They were just went on what they were doing. But you know that look? Oh, wow. Look how, like you don't know how bad off you are. You're gonna die. You're me. So I stayed there for 29 days and thought, eh, it'll be cool, you know? It'll be fine. She's not going to put me out. But I would always go out and get drunk just to come back when they came because I wanted to, like, I thought I, was, I would just annoy them, like ridicule them by showing up drunk. And they, again, they just give me the look. I still didn't know who they were. So 29th day comes. I'm thinking it's going to be all good. The next morning I get up and all my stuff's out in front of the door. I'm like, wait a minute, this is not how it usually goes. I should still be here. And she looked at me and she said, look, I can't have you stay at my house longer than 30 days because I'm not helping you. I'm like, what are you talking about? Sure you are. You're going to let me stay here and then tell me about your friends and those people? And she's like, no. And I said, where am I going to go? She said, it's not my problem. And I thought, what? I'm going to call mom on you. What do you mean this is not your problem? I believe today that is one of the many little God shots that I received that allowed me to get sober in Alcoholics Anonymous and make it to today. If she had let me stay there, I would have done what I always did. I can't not, not drink on my own. I would have, and you know what? She never asked me not to drink while I was there, by the way. She never said, if you go out and have a drink, you can't come home because she knew better. She's an alcoholic. She couldn't have done that. That's like, I mean, that's, that's, you can't ask an alcoholic, just, just don't drink. Just stop. Oh, okay. Now yeah, that'll work out. And so back to the knock on my door, you know, that was the next step. They were, that was my sister's sponsor. Said to her, are you willing to give her 30 days? Are you willing to not tell her she can't drink? Are you willing to care enough to tell her she has to go. I've heard young people talk a lot of times about finding your Ebby, and I've always thought in my sobriety that my sister was my Ebby. You know, she carried the message, she got me to where I needed to go to, and let me get to that place, that gift of desperation. I'm telling you, I have never seen another alcoholic continue to stay sober and be sober, live happy, joyous, and free without having some surrender and receiving that gift of desperation. I knew at that moment when she put me out that I was done because the next place for me was gonna be living on the beach or in the alleyway, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to do that. I'd heard about what happened to women that lived on the streets. I'd seen them. I, 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 had no, I didn't know what to do anymore. And when that happens for this alcoholic, I drop to my knees and I ask for help for even the only thing that I didn't even know that I needed to do that, but it was something intrinsic. I think that's in each one of us. You know, the big book says deep down within every man, woman, and child is the fundamental concept of God. That's the only place it can be found. I remember when I left there, I had written, I wish I brought this with me, I'd written a poem before I ever heard of Alcoholics Anonymous. And the poem was to some degree saying just that. It was that I know there's been a part of me that's been left safe and protected by you and that that's what was touched inside of me, my soul, when that happened, that was the place that was still under God's, God's guidance and control. Even though I didn't realize that too much later, that's my experience. So I came to Arizona, I went to that first AA meeting and uh, oh God, I saw the blue books and I went, oh, that's what they were doing. <laughs> and I got in there and the front of the room had this big podium and the front of it says, you are not alone. I still cry, I'm a crier. 
I still cry when I see that. That was the biggest thing for me when I was drinking is that even if I was with a room full of you, I was so lonely and so hopeless. I, I, I didn't, I couldn't understand. Why are you going to help me? How are, why are you going to help me? How did, I, that doesn't make sense to me. I don't understand. And then I'm going to help somebody else. I don't know what I'm doing. That's why I'm here. So I'm in the room and there's two women in the room, both blonde hair, both named Jennifer, gave me their phone numbers. And uh, I went home, called both of them, one I didn't get a hold of. And I came back to the meeting the next day and I ran up to this woman and said, oh, I'm so glad we, we connected. And she's like, I didn't talk to you. And she goes, she did. Now I'm 32 years old and my sponsor has just turned 20. She doesn't even drink in a bar. I'm like, oh no, honey, you're not going to handle this job. <laughs> oh boy. I didn't know that Jennifer was her sponsor, which meant that whatever Jennifer had been doing, my other, Je you know what I'm saying? Like, it was, we carried down the message the same way. She got me a big book. It wasn't, would you like a book? It was like, here's your book. What do you mean? This is the, this is the owner's manual. We need to, we're going to read this together. I'm not going to send you home and say, here, read the first 164 and get back to me. I gotta be honest with you. That does not make sense to me. That does not make sense to me. Here's a book that's written in a foreign language, figure it out and get back to me on it. So we sat down and we worked through the book together. I finished my first set of steps. I'm not bragging, but I'm telling you, I'm a real alcoholic. And if I did not get busy and find power, I was gonna die. That was my plan. I'm coming in here for 30 days. If you guys can't fix me, I'm walking right in front of a car because I know how to do it. And I will, I will do it. And in 90 days, she'd taken me through my first set of steps and she said, now listen, your sobriety is going to look different than some people because you've been through your steps. There's going to be some people that don't like that you've worked through your steps in 90 days and they're going to let you know it. But here's the thing, it's none of their business. That's between you and God. That is none of their business. And thank God that Bill and Bob didn't have that same conversation and decide, well, let's wait for a year before we do the steps with each other and I'll get back to you. I don't understand how that works. I'm an alcoholic. If you're a real alcoholic, we understand what we can't just wait around for that power to show up when, we're, when it's convenient. And so we went through the steps together. She showed me how to chair a meeting. She brought me up and showed me how to chair a meeting. She talked to me about the readings. She talked to me about a service commitment. I think I was 30 days sober and I was doing coffee, which was like, that is like the best it is because you get to meet everybody. However, there are times when someone forgets on a supply team to purchase coffee and you have to go to the podium and say, excuse me, there won't be coffee for 45 minutes, but we're getting it. Oh my God, people freaking out. It's like being a bartender again. Everybody's screaming for liquor, you know? And I was just like... You know, when, when Jennifer and I did the steps together, one of the things that I felt was a really profound experience for me was that when I had that first drink, I remember that feeling, like that, that, that feeling I was chasing for so long. And I knew I was powerless. I knew my life was unmanageable because on page 72, no, 70, which page is it? Um, oh God, I'm forgetting a page number. That's, that's a sign of old age. Um, anyway, 52, page 52, it talks about the fact that my imagibility didn't look like getting DUIs or going to jail or um, losing all my jobs. It was in here. Emotionally, I was devastated. I was destroyed in here. I, that was my imagibility. I could, I, I was devastated. Mentally and emotionally, spiritually, bankrupt doesn't even begin to describe it. I was angry at a God I didn't believe in. <laughs> My sponsor said, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> I know, but I am pissed. <laughs> so we go to the second step and she said, came to believe and a power greater than myself can restore me to sanity. And I'm like, what? I'm not insane. She said, let's talk about some of your thinking. Let's go back to the beginning about that, this part and that part. And I'm like, okay, you got me there. Okay. But I, she said, the real insanity is thinking every time that it'd be different. And I did. I really thought it would be different. I thought, oh, God, I'll just stay away from tequila. I won't do vodka. <laughs> Boone's Farm wine, that can't be bad. <laughs> well, it was. So that was my insanity when I started thinking that way. 
And you know, it's weird. At the, the longer I'm sober, alcohol can start becoming other things. And tell me if this makes sense to anybody. It's like, I may not be thinking about drinking, but I'm thinking about getting online and spending a couple of grand on something. Or I'm thinking about, oh, there's three casinos. I can just go in there for 10 minutes. It'll be fine. I won't lose all my money. Like my thinking continues to need work. It continue, my insanity will return. And eventually I will pick up a drink because the guilt and shame will bring me right back there. So we get to step three, and, you know, we're being really girly girl. We got the candle going and the incense. We're sitting out by the pool, and the lights are on. I'm like, this is like a first date. This is so weird. <laughs> so we held hands. We did the, the third step prayer. And I remember feeling like this moment of electric. And I looked at my sponsor, and I said, oh, my God. That's how I felt when I took my first drink. That's what I've been looking for. That, that's what I've been seeking. I was seeking the wrong spirits. I was looking for that in everything and everybody that I could come up with outside of me. You know, and this was empty. This was empty. And so we went through those steps and I raised my hand and I told people I'd be glad to sponsor them. I told people that I work, the way I work is that we check in with each other the first week because I want to make sure if you're going to actually not call me back and that's all I'm requiring, then you probably can't spend the time to do the step work because that's going to be a lot harder, trust me, and take a lot more time and attention. I got, always had a home group. All right, now, I'm going to tell you, for two months I didn't because I had a resentment about the old home group and then I had to clear that, clean that up, but I have a home group today. Don't my sponsor checking up on me and finding out I didn't tell you the truth about that. Um, oh. So, what happened was that I was given this incredible gift. I was given this incredible gift. Not only to stay sober, to, to live a sober life. You know how the big book says this is a design for living. I, I've been an alcoholic my whole life. I've never known how to live life. And my parents didn't either. And my grandparents and my great-grandparents, and they kept passing down bad information. <laughs> Because okay? alcohol was always the solution. It never worked. Last October, my dad at 84 years old passed away. People like to say it was from diabetes, but I know it was from alcoholism. He was still drinking right up to the time they took, he took his last breath. And he's got two kids in Alcoholics Anonymous with 30 plus years. I don't know why. But I know that I have to continue to do the actions that I was raised to do in Alcoholics Anonymous on a regular basis. I get to do them for the rest of my life. I get to have this way of living for the rest of my life. But gratitude I was taught is an action. I can be grateful all day and do nothing. Sit at home, not answer those calls when the sponsees call, not raise my hand when people say, do you wanna do some service work? Yeah, I'm gonna come late to the meeting, I'll leave early. I was taught come early, stay after the meeting, before the meeting, the meeting, the meeting, after the meeting. I was raised in Alcoholic Anonymous by big book thumpers. I mean, thumpers. We had to carry our books everywhere we went. <laughs> after the first part of the meeting, we were taken into the back room out of the kitchen, and we would study the big book together. I mean, we, we went to the meeting, went to get something to eat, came back for the next meeting, went to go get coffee, came back for the next meeting. It was... It, it was unbelievable. It, and I was so blessed with not having to work in that early part of my sobriety. And I was able to make that my focus. Because one of the things I've learned in Alcoholics Anonymous is I have watched people who have let what AA has given them take them away from AA and their recovery. And that scares me. That scares me because it's, really, it's not bad stuff that they're doing. I don't have children. But, well, I have four-legged children, furry ones. We rescue all kinds of critters. But... I know no matter what happens, this has to come first. It has to come first for me or I will drink again. That's what, that's what my alcoholism is all about. That's why I watch people who are struggling and I ask them, are you going to meetings? Are you praying and meditating? My sponsor, if I call her, the first thing she says, no matter what, and I have 31 years of sobriety, so I don't get away with anything with her. She's got a gazillion years. But she says, have you prayed about it? Click. I'm like, that was rude. 
But that's, that, is her, that was her gift to me, is that it's about a reliance on God, on a higher power that has to come first. Because see, I'm a human being and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess it up. I am gonna, I'm going to give the wrong answer. I'm going to get mad. I'm going to get jealous. I'm going to get restless, irritable, and discontent. It's going to happen. And my sponsor is too. I can't rely on human beings to keep me spiritually fit. In my experience, that does not work. And I have to be ready and willing to surrender. You know, I had a funny story. So I was at a, um, a business meeting for this new group that was forming. And uh, apparently the other women in the group were not too thrilled. This other woman came from another town. It might have been Prescott, I don't remember. And she wanted to make it a home group instead of a meeting. And they, four or five of them agreed on it. By the time we got to the full group, I don't know when it, how, what happened. I, I was like, it was like slow motion. All of a sudden, chairs were being thrown. I'm not kidding you. This is a woman's meeting. People were screaming and yelling at each other. Coffee was being thrown. I'm like, what the heck is going on? I'm like, talking, you know. So I said to her, you better go. And my friend who was at the meeting was like, what was that? I said, I have no idea what just happened here. And she said, well, I called my sponsor. I said, oh, good. What'd she say? Well, she said to tell you that we were both acting self-righteous. I said, no, 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 no. She wasn't talking about us. She meant the people in the meeting, right? The ones throwing the chairs. And she says, oh, no. I said, we're well, just passionate about what we do. She said, no, apparently we're self-righteous and we need to get over it and start working on that character defect with God because it's causing problems in our life. That's, that's how I was raised. I can't do anything about any of those people. If someone was injured, I could offer to help. But I mean, I'm the one that has to ask God for help to change whatever that defect is in me that's bringing all of this negative energy or this intention that's not honest. And other people around me can see it. And they don't like it. Imagine that. I had a sponsee this last week who I've been sponsoring her for about six months. And the most I've seen her talk to her is across the room and she waves at me. And I'm like, what the hell's that? <laughs> so I've tried to approach her in a very nice way. And I prayed about it. And I just said, you know, am I your sponsor? And she's like, and she's walking away. So I'm like, oh my gosh, this person is like, I'm letting this person drive me off the wall. I'm thinking about it all the time. I'm planning how I'm going to catch her in the parking lot. This is my old thinking, right? So... I called a friend and we were talking and she's like, well, it sounds to me like you may have let her cross your boundary a lot. Like what wasn't acceptable to you and you kept letting her. And so she's just doing what you taught her to do. You, it was on me. I should have told this person the way she wanted to work was not sponsorship to me. That's not how I sponsor. I'd be glad to introduce you to someone else, but that's not how I do things. I don't do a drive-by sponsorship. I don't sponsor by text, but I allowed it and I encouraged it. Why? Because my pride did not want me to think that I was a bad sponsor. And that's how these different defects of character show up in my life again. And I didn't like recognizing that at all. I mean, it was just, it was really uncomfortable. It's like, oh, do I have to make an amends too? And she's like, well, I don't know, we'll talk about it. And I'm like, oh. But you know what? If I let those things fester, I will drink. Because I cut you off, I cut off God, and I cut off the power of the program, and I will drink. And I simply can't do that. Not if I want to stay sober. Not if I want to be happy, joyous, and free. So today... I'm blessed to have met my husband in Alcoholics Anonymous. He was banging on a table, slamming a big book down. And I'm like, who is that asshole? I want to meet him. <laughs> he seems so engaged. Uh, I finished college, my bachelor's and my master's. I was able to spend 14 years helping people in the addiction field as a counselor and a therapist. Never thought I'd be able to do that. Um, I don't have a good relationship with my family. And I just want to share this. It's the best relationship that can be right now. I have learned that sometimes, even after making amends, there's addiction and mental illness in the family. There's toxicity. And I had to make a choice between my sobriety or continuing to encourage that behavior, those sickness, and how it affected me. Um, God love them, they moved to Texas. And I was like, now I can just call or I can do a set of card if I decide to do that. But you know what? They can be who they are. And I'm not judging them. And I'm not resentful. But I can't have them in my life. I just can't. And so sometimes those family relationships don't come back right away. 
Sometimes they wind up the best way they can. And I just, I want to say that because I spent years sitting in the rooms hearing, I thought everybody had their families back together. That's what it felt like and sounded like to me. And I, and I felt like, I felt like I was doing something wrong. And I went back for more and it was a bad idea. You know, it just was for me. So today, um, I also do another program that helps me with processing those feelings and I am grateful that God, once again, has been able to help me find what I needed to find. I'm grateful to be here this evening. I'm so grateful to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And with that, I'll pass.